The Preface of the Countess of Lowndes Square and Other Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Zechariah Raman The Countess of Lowndes Square and Other Stories by E. F. Benson Preface I have divided the stories that are here collected under one cover into various classes, so that such readers as want to compare their own experiments, let us say, in blackmailing or spiritualistic seances, with those of other students, may find such tales as deal with their own speciality in crime or superstition grouped together in separate sections of this book. They will thus be spared a skipping hunt through pages in which they feel no personal interest. In the same way, such readers as are in search of merely the lighter, though not more decorative, aspects of life, will be able to avoid like poison so innocent-looking a title as the Countess of Lawn Square, for assuredly they would not find therein the fashionable descriptions of high life which they might reasonably anticipate, but would merely cast the book from them in disgust when they discovered that one who had been the wife of an earl, and ought therefore to have known ever so much better, belonged to the most contemptible of the criminal classes. The table of contents in like manner conducts the crank and the cat lover to the pastures where he is most likely to find a digestible snack. The short story is not a lyre on which the English writers thrum with the firm delicacy of the French or with the industry of the American author. If the ten best short stories in the world were proclaimed by popular vote, it is probable that they would all be French stories, while if the million worst stories in the world was similarly brought into one unspeakable library, they would probably all of them, with the exception of course of the fourteen that make up this volume, be found to be written in America. There is something in the precision and economy of the French, something in the opulence and amateurishness of the United States that renders the result of such a plebiscite perfectly appropriate, and we should only when the result of the poll was known, find in it another instance of the invariable occurrence of the expected. Most of the ensuing tales have appeared before in the pages of Nash's Weekly, The Windsor Magazine, The Storyteller, The Century, and The Woman at Home. The rest are now published for the first time. E. F. Benson End of preface. Section 1 of The Countess of Lowndes Square and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim's Vox 4. The Countess of Lowndes Square and Other Stories by E. F. Benson Section 1 Blackmailing Stories Chapter 1 The Countess of Lowndes Square Cynthia, Countess of Hampshire, was sitting in an extraordinarily elaborate dressing gown one innocent morning in June, alternately opening letters and eating spoonfuls of sour milk prepared according to the prescription of Professor Metchnikoff. Every day it made her feel younger and stronger and more irresponsible, which is the root of all joy to natures of a serious disposition. And since, when a fortnight before she began this abominable treatment, she felt very young already, she was now almost afraid that she would start again on measles, croup, hoops, whooping cough, peppermints, and other childish ailments and passions. But since this treatment not only induced youth, 
but was discouraging to all microbes but its own she hoped as regards ailments that she would continue to feel younger and younger without suffering the penalties of childhood the sour milk was finished long before her letters were all opened and there was no one in london who had a larger and more festive post than she indeed it was no wonder that everybody of sense and most people of none wanted her to eat their dinners and stay in their houses for her volcanic enjoyment of life made the dullest of social functions a high orgy and since nothing is nearly so infectious as enjoyment it followed that she was in much request even in her fiftieth year she retained with her youthful zest for life much of the extreme plainness of her girlhood but time was gradually lightening the heaviness of feature that had once formed so remarkable an ugliness and in a few years more no doubt she would become as nice-looking as everybody else of her age her father the notorious probably infamous baron cacao of mixed and uncertain origin had at one time compiled by hook or crook chiefly it is to be feared by crook an immense fortune but long after that was spent and debts of an equally substantial nature had been substituted for it he continued to live in london in a blaze of splendour so oriental that he was still believed to be possessed of fabulous wealth and had without the least difficulty married the plain but fascinating cynthia to an elderly earl of hampshire and had continued to allow her ten thousand pounds a year which he borrowed at a staggering rate of usury from optimistic hebrews they thought that lord hampshire would probably see to his father-in-law's debts while rather humorously lord hampshire was post obiting himself with others who trusted that baron cacao would come to the rescue of his son-in-law consequently when he and cynthia's disgusting husband expired within a few hours of each other the widowed and orphaned countess was left without a penny in the world and in rama there was a voice heard lamentation and great mourning father and husband were both sad rogues and in death in more than a chronological sense it is highly probable that they were not divided it will therefore be easily imagined that her childhood and marriage had been a sound and liberal education to lady hampshire for they had taught her that the world in general is very easily imposed upon and that if you are intending to be a villain the path of villainy is made much smoother to the pilgrim if he smiles shakespeare perhaps had given her the germ of that invaluable truth but as in countless other instances her brilliant brain brought to full flower what was only an immature bud of knowledge in any case the villain so she shrewdly reasoned must keep his frown to himself and however dreadful the machinations on which he is employed must cultivate a dewy bonhomie in public and pretend to be innocently engrossed in the pleasures and palaces of this delightful world lady hampshire went farther than this especially since she had taken to sour milk and actually was engrossed in them for a large majority of the hours of those entrancing summer days but like all game fish she had a close time which occurred every morning over her post for to let the reader into her terrible and unsuspected secret she was an earnest and adroit blackmailer it's easy to find excuses if excuses are needed to account for her adoption of so vivid and thrilling a life for indeed it's difficult to see how she could have existed at all without some such source of income as this and still less could she have kept up her delightful house in lowndes square 
her cottage in the Cotswolds, her luxurious and rapid motor-car, her box at the opera, her wonderful toilettes at Sandown and Epsom, and Newmarket and Aix and Marienbad. All these simple pleasures were really a necessity of life to her, while in addition to that she rightly regarded them as an indispensable part of her make-up as a blackmailer, a mask behind which she could securely grin. Had she, with her historic name, gone to live in Whitechapel or Bayswater, people would have inevitably concluded that she was hard up, and in the charitable manner characteristic of the world, have wondered how she managed to live at all, except by some course of secret and remunerative crime. Whereas the genial and affluent countess, who gave her box at the opera not to her friend, for she was too clever for that, but to her possible enemies, whenever she did not want it, which was six nights in the week, since she detested music as much as she detested detectives, was a woman who need not laugh at suspicion, simply because there were no suspicions to laugh at. Nobody bothered himself or herself as to how she got her money, just because she always spent it so delightfully. If she had not spent it thus, or if there had been none to spend, there would have been an excellent cause for the world to wonder where it came or did not come from. A word is necessary for the sake of those few who may possibly be ignorant of how such things are pleasantly managed, as to her methods when in pursuit of her profession. From an amateur standpoint, and to the world at large, she was, as has been said, Cynthia, Countess of Hampshire. But in her business capacity, and to the scarcely less numerous world of her trembling clients, she was Agatha Ainsley, Miss. Here she differed from Shakespeare, for she held that there was a great deal in a name, and, apart from the obvious objections to trading as Cynthia Hampshire, there was in the sound of Agatha Ainsley much which would inspire a misplaced confidence. Agatha Ainsley to any one entering into business relations with her for the first time, would seem to be a not unkindly blackmailer. She might suitably have lived in a cathedral close with her sister. There was something wistful and pathetic about the title. It was in no way sharkish. She sounded gentle, though her immediate mission might appear diabolical. She was a pleasant dentist, who might be supposed to treat you to nasty jabs and vivid extractions for your permanent good. In Lady Hampshire's life, past as it was in country houses and restaurants and continental spas, it was no wonder that she found many clients. There was scarcely a scandal in London that did not reach her sympathetic ear before it became public, and there were certainly many scandals that reached that eager orifice which never became public at all. She had a memory which bordered on the Gladstonian for retentiveness, and a terrifying and menacing pen, and a few words dropped secretly into her ear came out of Agatha's stylograph with blistering effect. But with the innate kindness of her nature, she never allowed Agatha to blackmail any who could not afford to pay, and she had several times deferred the extraction of her little fines until it was certain that her client would not be seriously embarrassed, and possibly driven to the desperate course of denouncing her. Never had she reason to blame herself for a suicide, and she had Sir Andrew Clarke's authority for believing that no one ever died of sleeplessness. She only milked the fat, sleek cows, and twisted the tails of the bulky bulls. Indeed, as she quaintly said to herself, she looked upon the payments they made as a sort of insurance against indiscretions on their part in the future. She protected them against their lower instincts, 
her arrangements for agatha were thoughtful in the extreme years ago her father had owned a small house in whitstable street of the kind described in auctioneering circles as bijou which backed on to her own less jewel-sized mansion in Lowndes square this house in whitstable street had providentially escaped the notice of his creditors when his affairs if an entire absence of assets can be considered affairs were wound up and in order to give miss ainslie a discreet and convenient home it had only been necessary to cut a door through the back of a big closet in her bedroom in Lowndes square the rates and taxes of the bijou were punctually paid by agatha who had of course a separate banking account and a curious sloping hand while a secret and terrible old woman called magsby whom lady hampshire could ruin on the spot for forging a valueless check of her father's opened the door to the clients and made gruesome haddocky meals for herself in the kitchen upstairs lady hampshire kept her agatha clothes in which she looked like some unnatural cross between a hospital nurse and the sort of person who gets more stared at than talked to and when she had found a home for the guileless young carpenter who fashioned her means of communication between Lowndes square and whitstable street in a remote though salubrious district of western australia it really seemed as if she might laugh at the idea of detectives she had but to lock herself into her bedroom and in five minutes agatha with her spectacles and rouge and terrible wig would be firmly conversing with clients in whitstable street then when a pleasant conclusion had been come to five minutes more would be sufficient and lady hampshire would emerge from her bedroom refreshed by her rest and ready to immerse herself in a perfect spate of fashionable diversions such to lady hampshire's effusive and optimistic mind was her career as it should have been but occasionally the hard sordid facts of existence put spokes in the wheel that should have whirled so merrily and as she sat this morning in her elaborate dressing-gown she found a spoke of the most obstructive kind agatha's letters had as usual been placed outside the door of communication by the terrible magsby and lady hampshire on the principle of business first pleasure afterwards had answered all the letters sent to herself which dealt with the social pleasures of town before she opened the far more exciting packet of agatha's correspondence the very first of them made her feel as if she had several lowering diseases in the pit of her stomach it ran thus to miss agatha ainsley dear madam i have learned your terrible secret and know the means whereby you acquire your great and ill-gotten wealth believe me my heart bleeds for you that in your position you should ever have had to descend to the crime of blackmailing which as you are well aware is regarded in a very serious and perhaps even brutal light by the otherwise humane code of english law now i make no threats i studiously avoid them but if you can help a deserving and struggling individual already past the prime of life i assure you on my sacred word of honour that you will not sleep the less soundly for it a pittance of one thousand pounds a year paid quarterly and in advance would be considered perfectly satisfactory my messenger shall call on you this afternoon at a quarter past three and i earnestly suggest that the first payment should then and there be given him faithfully yours m s p s motives of delicacy prevent my mentioning my name 
a cheque therefore would be less welcome than banknotes or gold cynthia hampshire shuddered as she read often and often she had wondered with kindly amazement at the hair-like timidity of her clients who so willingly paid their little mites to the upkeep of her establishment when a moment's courage would have taken them hot foot to the smiling and hospitable portals of scotland yard but as she perused this perfectly sickening communication she found herself in the true sense of the word sympathizing with them that is to say suffering with them it really was most uncomfortable being blackmailed for something of an illegal nature which you actually had done and she no longer wondered at the lamb-like acquiescence with which her clients fell in with the not unreasonable terms that she offered them the thought of calling at scotland yard with this outrageous letter occurred to her but at the idea of appealing for protection her soul cried out like a child in the dark and her courage oozed from her like drippings from a squeezed sponge furthermore so spirited a proceeding was rendered even less feasible by the fact that it was not lady hampshire who was being blackmailed but her agatha she doubted very much if she would be allowed by the odious meticulosity of english law to prosecute on behalf of poor miss ainsley who must suddenly have gone abroad while the idea of going to the house of vengeance in the disguise and habiliments of that injured spinster was outside the limits of her sober imagination and who could m s be with his veiled threats and nauseating denial of them she ran rapidly through the list of her clients but found none whom she could reasonably suspect of so treacherous a feat very reluctantly she was forced to the conclusion that she would have to pay the first quarter anyhow of this cruel levy luckily agatha had been doing very well lately for london had been amusing itself with no end of questionable antics and there was a prospect of a good season to come but two hundred and fifty pounds per quarter would assuredly take a considerable portion of guilt off poor miss ainsley's gingerbread and it was once clear to lady hampshire that she must raise agatha's rates she was lunching that day with colonel ascot an old and valued friend though still only a year or two past fifty he had made three large fortunes of which he had lost two but the third which he had rapidly scooped out of the rubber boom had sent him bounding upwards again and she had more than once wondered if she could get him on to agatha's list more than once also in answer to his repeated proposals she had thought of marrying him but she did not think it right to accept his devotion without telling him about agatha and it seemed scarcely likely that he would wish his wife to have such an alter ego for as agatha she led such a thrilling and tremendous existence that it would be a great wrench to annihilate that exciting spinster in the noose of matrimony on the other hand if agatha's business was to be threatened by these bolts from the blue in the shape of demands from m s the pain of parting with her would be appreciably less severe the matter required fresh and careful consideration lady hampshire had several other clients to write to and it was time when she had finished this correspondence and put it through the secret door at the back of the bedroom closet to be collected and posted by grim magsby to exchange her dressing gown for the habiliments of lunch and civilization a new costume had come to her from paquin's that morning and as she was to go to two charity bazaars a matinee and as many tea parties as there was time for between the end of the matinee and the early dinner which was to precede another theatre and a couple of balls she decided to wear this sumptuous creation anything new 
provided the point of it was not to be old, put this mercurial lady into excellent humour, and she set out for lunch, which was only just across the square, not more than half an hour late, looking as the representative of a fashion paper, who was standing at the corner, on the chance of seeing her, told her readers the following Saturday, very smart and well-gowned. She knew she was certain to meet friends, since that always happened, and by the time she took her seat next to her host, finding lunch already half over, she had quite dismissed from her mind the trouble of poor Miss Ainsley. But how delicious to see food again, she said as she sat down. I was so afraid lunchtime was never coming that I didn't recognise it when it came. And we were afraid that you were never coming, dear Cynthia, said the Duchess of Camber. I know, I am late, but as I always am late, it is the same as if I was punctual. The really unpunctual people are those who sometimes are late, and sometimes not. Colonel Ascot has the other punctuality. He is always in time. Cynthia looked around the table. There were but half a dozen guests, but all these were old friends, and by a not uncommon coincidence, half of them were clients of Agatha, while the Duchess of Camber, so Lady Hampshire knew, was quite likely to become one, for she had lately taken to doing her shopping at Mason's stores, and spent a long time over it. Colonel Ascot glanced, apparently with purpose, at the Louis the Sixteenth clock that stood on the mantelpiece. "'One wastes a lot of time if one is punctual,' he said. "'But after all, one has all the time there is.' "'But there isn't enough, though one has it all,' said Lady Hampshire. "'Today, for instance, would have to be doubled, as one doubles at bridge, if I was to do all I have promised to.' "'But you won't, dear, so it doesn't matter,' said the Duchess. "'In any case, there is always time for what one wants to do, and one can omit the rest.' I always thought my time was completely taken up, but I find I can do my own shopping at Mason's as well. I buy soap and candles and sealing wax and take them home in the motor. But not every morning, asked Lady Hampshire, beginning to attend violently. Practically every afternoon. I always find I have forgotten something I meant to buy the day before. Also, it's a sort of retreat. One never meets there anybody one knows, which is such a rest. I don't have to grin and talk. Lunch was soon over, and instead of having coffee and cigarettes served at the table, Colonel Ascot got up. I do hope, Lady Hampshire, he said, that you and the others will not hurry away, and that you will excuse me, as I have a most important engagement at a quarter past three, which I cannot miss. It is very annoying and the worst of it is that I made the appointment myself, quite forgetting that I was to have the pleasure of seeing you at lunch. Am I to take your place as hostess? she asked, as she sat down with him for a moment in a corner of the drawing-room. If you will, both now and always, said he. She laughed. He had proposed to her so often that a repetition was not in the least embarrassing. But somehow, today... He looked unusually attractive and handsome, and she was more serious with him than was her wont. Also, the thought of doing business for Agatha was in her mind. "'Ah, my dear friend,' she said, "'I should have to know so much more about you first. For instance, that appointment of your own making seems to me to need inquiry. Now be truthful, Colonel Ascot, and tell me if it is not a woman you are going to see.' "'Well, it is.' "'I knew it,' she said. "'But you must let me tell you more,' said he. "'She is an old governess of my sister's, whom I... Uh, I want to be kind to. Such a good old soul, the sort of helpless old lady with whom one couldn't break an appointment that one had made.' Lady Hampshire laughed again. <laughs> "'Your details are admirable,' she said. And detail is of such prime importance in any artistic production. Artistic production, said he. Surely you don't suspect me of... 
I suspect everybody of everything, she interrupted lightly, owing to my extensive knowledge of myself. But go on, I want more details. What is the name and address of this helpless old governess? Miss Agatha Ainsley, said he. She lives in Whitstable Street, just off the square. Lady Hampshire had nerves of steel. If they had been of any other material, they must have snapped like the strings of the lyre of hope in Mr. Watt's picture. Only in this case, there would not have been a single one left. Colonel Ascot going to see Agatha at a quarter past three? How on earth did he know of Agatha's existence? What was Agatha to him, or he to Agatha? And surely it was at a quarter past three that the messenger of the ruthless M.S. was going to call at Whitstable Street, where he would find the packet of banknotes for £250 that Lady Hampshire had made ready before she came out to lunch. Would they meet on the doorstep? What did it all mean? Her head whirled, but she managed to command her voice. What a delightful name, she said. I'm sure Miss Ainsley must be a delightful old lady, with ringlets and a vinaigrette and a mourning brooch. I haven't seen her for years, said Colonel Ascot. I will tell you about her when we meet again. Do let it be soon. Perhaps you would drop in for tea today, she suggested, expunging from her mind several other engagements. I shall be alone. That will make up for my curtailed luncheon party, said he. He made his excuses to his guests, and after allowing him a liberal time in which he could leave the house, Lady Hampshire rose also. You are not going yet, dear Cynthia, asked the Duchess. I wanted to talk to you about the advantage of doing your shopping at Mason's, and the danger of it, she added catching Lady Hampshire's kind, understanding eye. Lady Hampshire felt torn between conflicting interests. Here, she unerringly conjectured, there was fish to fry for Agatha, and yet other fish, so to speak, who perhaps wanted to fry. Agatha demanded a more immediate attention. The Duchess's complication must wait. She was dining with her tomorrow. Colonel Ascot was going to see Agatha. Nothing must prevent Lady Hampshire from hearing what his business was. She went across the square and let herself into her own house. There were half a dozen telegrams lying on the hall table, but without dreaming of opening any, she went straight to her bedroom and locked the door. Someone, probably the second footman, was being funny at the servants' dinner, for shrieks of laughter ascended from the basement. As a rule, she loved to know that her household was enjoying itself, but today that merriment left her cold, and next moment she was in Agatha's house and pursing her lips into the shrill whistle with which she always summoned Magsby. I left a note addressed to M.S., she said. I want it. The words were yet in her mouth when the bell of Agatha's front door rang in an imperious manner, and Lady Hampshire peeped cautiously out through the yellow muslin blinds. On the doorstep was standing an old, old man with a long white beard. He leaned heavily on a stick and wore a frayed overcoat. She tiptoed back from the window. Give me the note, she said, and wait till I get upstairs. Then answer the door and tell Methuselah that Miss Ainsley will be down in a moment. Lady Hampshire stole up to Agatha's room and hastily assumed her grey wig, her spectacles, her rouge, her large elastic-sided boots, her lip salve, her creaking alpaca gown, and with the envelope containing banknotes for £250, addressed in Agatha's dramatic sloping handwriting to the messenger of MS, descended again to her sitting-room. Methuselah rose as she entered, and she made him her ordinary prim Agatha bow, and spoke in Miss Ainsley's husky treble voice the messenger of m s she observed quite so that is my name for the present said the old man in a fruity tenor i received your master's note sir 
said agatha and you cannot be expected to know what pain and surprise it caused me but what does he suppose he is going to get by it lady hampshire was not used to spectacles and they dimmed her natural acuteness of vision besides making her eyes ache before her was a sordid old ruin of humanity red-eyed white-bearded a prey it would seem to lumbago nasal guitar and other senile ailments probably in a few minutes for it was scarcely a quarter past three yet colonel ascot would arrive and again her head whirled at the thought of the possible nightmares that providence still had in store for her methuselah blew his nose i fancy my master rather expected to get two hundred and fifty pounds in notes or gold he said he knows a good deal about miss ainsley he does he is quite willing to share his knowledge with others he is lady hampshire raised her head proudly so that she could get a glimpse of this old ruffian under her spectacles the ways of genius are past finding out and she could never give a firm reason for what she said next a brilliant unconscious intuition led her to say it there is nothing the world may not know she said in england it is no crime to be poor and though i have been in a humble position all my life my life has been an honest one there is no disgrace inherent in the profession of a governess for many years i was governess to colonel ascot's sister good god said methuselah that was sufficient for lady hampshire she took off her spectacles altogether and closely scrutinized that astonished roomy face and then her kindly soul was all aflame with indignation at this dastardly attempt to blackmail poor agatha in fact now i look at you she said i recognize you no wonder you blaspheme i remember the bright boy who used to come in and sit in the schoolroom while my pupil and i were at our lessons you have aged very much colonel ascot in that moment of recognition she made up her mind she could never marry him she could never even lunch with him again he was atrocious methuselah rose you are labouring under some strange mistake he said i will call again there is no mistake at all said lady hampshire quickly forgetting in her perfectly natural indignation to employ the husky treble tones which were characteristic of miss ainsley except the mistake that you have made in thinking that you could with impunity blackmail a defenceless old governess like me where is scotland yard i shall drive there immediately and you shall come with me i shall ring the bell she got up quickly and then sat down again exactly where she had been and methuselah looked at her very carefully then he suddenly burst into peals of bass laughter but you have aged very much too lady hampshire he said good god said agatha ainsley magsby waiting in the passage outside felt uncertain as to what her duty was she heard her mistress's voice and the voice of another shrieking with laughter which seemed to gather volume and enjoyment the longer it went on eventually she thought it best to retreat to the basement and prepare haddocks for dinner but my dear let us be serious said lady hampshire at length tell me before i begin to laugh again how on earth you ever heard of my poor agatha a mutual client said colonel ascot fanning himself with his long white beard poor jimmy dennison he told me in a fit of natural exasperation when i was reminding him about what happened at brighton last september that he could not afford to pay for the same thing twice over once to me and once to agatha ainsley the poor boy showed me the counterfoils of his cheque-book it was agatha ainsley and martin sampson all the way it was but natural since he could not pay that i should turn to agatha and see if she could but are you really one of us said lady hampshire apparently are you there was a fresh relapse of laughter and then lady hampshire pulled herself together 
I will go halves in Jimmy Dennison, she said. Whatever we may get, you may say you have squared Agatha. He ought to give you something for your trouble, or I will say I have squared Samson. It makes no difference, said Colonel Ascot. But I am afraid our interests conflict in many quarters. For instance, the poor Duchess of Camber. Shopping at Mason's, interrupted Lady Hampshire. My dear friend, she is mine. She was going to tell me all about it this afternoon, only I had to come over here to see about Agatha. Again, Colonel Ascot exploded with laughter. But she told me about it yesterday, he said and I had already drafted a short letter to her from Martin Sampson. Lady Hampshire was annoyed at this, since the Duchess was so very rich and so very silly. I don't know what we can do, she said. We can't appoint an arbitrator, can we? No arbitrator of really high character would undertake to settle the differences of two blackmailers. It is very important that an arbitrator should be beyond suspicion. We had really better make it one firm, Cynthia, said he. She had often considered his proposal before, but never so favourably. Agatha need not be annihilated now. Agatha would probably grow even more tumultuously alive. Yes, perhaps we had, she said. Oh, yes, most decidedly. So... They lived happily and wealthily and amazingly for another twenty-four years. There is much yet that might be said about them. End of Section 1 Section 2 of The Countess of Lowndes Square and Other Stories this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim's Vox 4. The Countess of Lowndes Square and Other Stories by E. F. Benson. Section 2. Blackmailing Stories. Chapter 2. The Blackmailer of Park Lane. Arthur Waitley had known very well what it was like to be desperately poor and in consequence, when he became so desperately rich that money ceased to mean anything to him, his pity for the penurious was not hysterical or exaggerated. He could recall very vividly what it felt like to have neither tea, dinner, nor supper, and to wake in the morning, stiff and cold as armour, on a bench on the embankment, and see the ridiculous needle of Cleopatra stonily pointing heavenwards against the sky in which the stars were beginning to burn dim at the chilly approach of day. He had known how icy the feet become when they have been close clasped all night long in the frayed embraces of gaping leather, but he had known also how sweet and surprising it is to eat when food is imperiously demanded by the cravings of long-continued abstinence, and how ineffably luxurious to get warm, when limbs have ached themselves numb. He would have been willing to confess that unveneered destitution had its inconveniences, but it was false sentiment to deny that it had its compensations also. It was when he was just sixteen that Luck, the great veiled goddess whom all the world so wisely worships, had paid him her first visit. He had been hanging about at the covered portico of the Lyceum Theatre one night, watching the well-fed world being lumpily deposited at the doors, when a silly old pink gentleman, in paying his cabman, dropped a promising pocketbook in the roadway. For one half-second the boy deliberated, wondering instinctively, though he had never heard of the proverb, if honesty was the best policy. In other words, how much the pocketbook contained and how much the foolish old gentleman would give him if he picked it up and returned it. A couple of pence, perhaps, for he looked a coppery gent. But the debate lasted scarcely longer than it took the pocketbook to fall. In a moment, his wise decision was made. He had picked it up 
recognising in that delightful incident the smile of the great goddess, had dived under the Roman nose of the cab horse and fled into the street where a chill, unpleasant rain was falling. Luck still smiled on him, for the night was foggy, and as soon as he had crossed the street he dropped into the habitual shuffling pace of the homeless, and returned to the portico which he had so lately quitted, since it was theoretically impossible that the thief should do anything so foolish. The silly old pink gentleman had not yet ceased to gesticulate and gibber in the direction in which he himself had just vanished, and an obsequious policeman was apparently taking down all the bad words he used in a neat notebook. Arthur wondered if he would arrest the old man for indulging in language redolent of faint praise in a public place. Meantime, he had thrust the pocketbook, that incarnate smile of the beneficent goddess, into his shirt, and it slid comfortably down against his skin till it was brought to anchor by the string which he had so strictly tied round his braceless trousers, since pressure in those regions minimised the abhorrence of vacuum. Then he slouched back to the embankment, and with head bowed over his knees, as if in sleep, he counted the tail of his treasure, taking out each item separately and screening them from the parental scrutiny of policemen in the cavern of his hand. There were two pieces of the fabulous crinkly paper, there were three sovereigns, and, what was immensely important for immediate purposes, a couple of shillings, translatable without suspicion into rich fried fish. One of his trouser pockets was a secure harbourage, and into this he piloted the golden ship. Then, with a stroke of high wisdom, he thrust the pocket-book through the interstices of the bench, instead of keeping about him so incriminating a piece of merchandise, and slouched away, saying good-bye to roofless bedchambers by the sweet Thameside for ever. Tonight, as he sat in the great dining-room of his house in Park Lane, the memory of that divine evening was vividly brought to his mind. Three friends had dined with him, and as the night proved foggy, they had abandoned the idea of seeing the most incompletely clad dancer that the London County Council had at present licensed, and had decided to stay at home and play bridge. A cold, foggy night, sir, had been the pronouncement that followed the butler's news that the motors were round, and the simple words had conjured up that wonderful night of his boyhood, with the vividness of hallucination. Bates, too, had a Roman nose, just like the cab horse, and Bates, by a strange coincidence, had just laid by his plate a couple of banknotes and some change, since he had found himself completely destitute of coin. Had he ever enjoyed himself so much in all these fat years as on that cold, lean, foggy evening so long ago. Honestly, or dishonestly, he could not believe that he had, for there had been about it the one and only and original spice. Then, for the first time, he had heard the clear call of the great golden goddess. She had called often since. Indeed, for years she had never ceased calling and it was not too much to say that for years she had been madly and unreasonably in love with him. He received her with yawns now, like some poor discarded mistress, but the chilly reception never deterred her. She never noticed that he was bored, and his indifference seemed but to inflame her ardour. Solid, monotonous good luck, had followed him all the days of his life, ever since the night when he was sixteen and so happily stole the pocket-book, all he had touched turned to gold, all he had desired had been granted him, all his ideals, such as they were, had frozen into cold, suety facts. 
half of the thirteen pounds, which were the result of his original theft, had been expended in reach-me-down clothes and ready-made boots, which, in those happy years, could be purchased by others than millionaires, for it was symptomatic of him never to grudge money when it was probably a good investment, and between his natural smartness of face and carriage and the acquired smartness of his new clothes, he had at once got a place as a hall boy in an hotel. He learned to swim in the Chelsea baths, and August was scarcely begun when this recreation was turned to solid account, for, being at Margate on a bank holiday, a pleasure boat conveniently capsized near him, and he easily rescued the only daughter of a prosperous bookmaker. That gentleman seemed not to resent the unexpected survival of a rat-faced child, had given him fifty pounds in cash, and, subsequently, several racing tips by way of a gilt-edged security for the fifty pounds. These proved not to be gilt-edged only, but completely covered with pure gold. Then came the news of possibilities in South Africa, and, gambler as he was, in every drop of blood in his body, he had gone for these with a thousand pounds to his credit. He threw his thousand pounds at the rand, and, as if he had given it a little emetic pill, the rand belched gold at him. In ten years, though he had enjoyed those years quite enormously, the savour of money-making grew stale, and with a brilliant excursion into American rails, which returned him his fortune more than doubled, he quitted the speculative arena, and for the last decade and a half had looked with eyes of incredulous wonder at the extraordinary gentleman who continued to go to offices in the city all day long and industriously accumulate what they did not want. There was one such here tonight, a great, round, dark man with yellow hair, the colour of a London fog. He took a grudged month's holiday in the year, but otherwise sat in an office with his ear to a telephone and his mouth to a speaking tube. Perhaps it amused him, for certainly there was always in his eye a remote twinkle, as if he had constant grounds for private mirth, and Arthur Waitley had often suspected him of being a secret humorist. Yet, in the ordinary commerce of social life, none was so heavy or so commonplace. He and his wife were social climbers of pathetic industry, who gave parties that tried to be smart and only succeeded in being garish. Yet there was that secret twinkle in his eye. The same good luck had dogged Arthur Waitley in affairs more intimate to his happiness than gold. He had married the woman whom he adored, and just when his adoration had cooled and she was beginning to bore him to extinction, she had run away with somebody else. He had wanted the particular house in which he now sat, and the owner had died just when his demise was most convenient, leaving his affairs in an unutterable confusion, and his executors were delighted to sell everything. He had, again, in artistic spheres, conceived a violent passion for the pictures of Giovanni Bollini, and an impecunious peer, foreseeing that income taxes and death duties were swelling like inflated footballs, had sold him his priceless collection, which now hung round the walls of his dining room. Finally, on this particular evening, when he felt very much disinclined to go out, Providence had sent a fog to serve as an excuse for stopping in. And yet, Bridge was a rather stale affair. There was a certain intellectual pleasure in thwarting other people, but it was not much fun being clever when the rest were, comparatively speaking, such fools. His private band had been assembled in the gallery of the ballroom in case music was required, but they had been dismissed since the four went straight from the dining room into the fan room where a card table was laid out. These fans were famous and had once been the property of Marie Antoinette and other ladies whose goods had been disposed of after their death 
by their executors or executioners, and Arthur Waitley had acquired them at immense expense during the year of his married life to please his wife. Shortly after he divorced her, an attempt had been made by a burglar to steal them, but an ingenious device invented by himself after his wife's departure had impeded the idea, for anyone entering the fan room after the apparatus had been set caused merry peals of electric bells to break out in the rooms of the butler, footman, oddman, and other able-bodied persons, and the intended burglar had been caught fan-handed. But his confession that the late Mrs. Waitley had commissioned him to attempt this job so interested Arthur Waitley that he took no proceedings with regard to him except to give him supper. His wife, simultaneously, rose considerably in his estimation. He had not known she had so much blood in her. The fan room overlooked the park, and regardless of possible interpretations, Arthur Waitley had straw permanently put down in the roadway to deaden the noise of traffic. There had been a ruffle with the vestry on the subject of this straw. Men with pitchforks came and took it up, but as often as they took it up, he had it renewed, and by now it had become as much a feature of Park Lane as the omnibuses. Occasionally, a policeman, new to the beat, and fired by professional enthusiasm, would question the straw strewers, but the mystic whisper, a friend of Mr. Waitley's, had the forcefulness and wit of brevity about it. The game was tepid. Not even his opponent's remarkable and reiterated revoke in No Trumps really warmed it, and Arthur Waitley was glad when his guests departed, for, unaccustomed as he was to brooding over imaginary troubles, or dulling his very acute brain with the narcotic poisoning of self-analysis, he was a little anxious about himself tonight, and was glad of a quiet hour before going to bed to examine the cause of his disquietude. It was still early when they left, for there was a dawn somewhere to which the two ladies, with the irrepressible enthusiasm of advanced middle age, were going on, while the financier was going home. On the doorstep, he confided to his host that his name was to appear next morning among the peerages given in honour of the king's birthday, and Arthur Waitley supposed he was going to seek the privacy of his own study to practice writing his new name, which was to be Peebles, in memory of pleasure. He adjusted the bell-peeling apparatus in the fan room and retired to his own sitting room, which adjoined his bedroom. Half a dozen exquisite wattos decorated the walls, and the bureau which stood opposite the door was from the effects of the unfortunate Queen of France. Often and often, he had thrilled at the thought that she had sat there and written those little ill-spelled notes in her sprawling hand, but tonight he would not have cared if he had found her sitting there in person. Tedium vitae, the weariness, the boredom of success, which poisons the lives of emperors and scratch golfers, had laid its heavy hand on him. He had poached the world like an egg but he could find no salt. So it was that which ailed him. Often of late he had found that he had little zest for this pursuit or that, but it had not struck him till this moment that the whole affair was flat. And yet it was not himself, so he felt, that was to blame. He was still but a year or two past fifty, handsome and healthy, and his powers of enjoyment he knew were undimmed, provided he could find something to exercise them on. In himself he was eager, alert, longing for excitement, but to do the same thing over and over again did not excite him. The early years of hunger and struggle and achievement had accustomed him to a high level of emotion. He wanted to burn not to smoulder quietly away, as most people were content to do. Indeed, he had done everything he could think of. He had loved and married, and been bored, 
and had no intention of tempting the ennui of domesticity again. Nor had he any tastes for the more irregular pleasures of the senses. They were all poached and saltless. Material possessions, of course, had ceased to interest him, since he was completely surrounded with all that he thought most exquisite in the world of art, and to accumulate for the mere sake of accumulation seemed to him an exhibition of pig trough greed. And it was so easy. He could buy anything that was for sale. Perhaps if Mr Morgan or some insatiable hoarder owned a desirable piece or picture and would not part with it at any price, he might find a secret rapture in attempting to steal it, just as his wife had done with the fans. But otherwise the act of acquisition had become too easy to be any longer agreeable. Everything wanted salt, but that was the fault of the objective world. He, subjectively, had as good an appetite as on the entranced and canonised evening when he stole the pocketbook of the silly pink man, that unconscious founder of his fortunes, who, vastly sillier than ever, had dined with him only last week and had had a fatal apoplectic seizure immediately afterwards. Tonight he almost cursed his memory for his foolishness thirty-five years ago for it was that theft which had led to this weariness. If only the poor pink departed had caught him and given him a taste of jail, Arthur Waitley felt he might now be rapturously pursuing the thrilling hazardous paths of the hardened criminal, to whom every house is a possible crib to be cracked, every jewel in a woman's necklace a week of delirium and drunken debauch. But where's the fun of stealing, if you already own more than you can possibly want? In his mind, he swiftly ran through the Ten Commandments and found, as he had feared, that it would not give him the slightest pleasure to break any of them. There might be a little excitement about bearing false witness against your neighbour, but then that would entail appearing in a law court and listening to the pitiful humour of some fussy judge. As for the rest of the commandments, they suggested nothing amusing. There was nothing to be done with the fifth, because his father and mother had been dead for years. The sixth implied blood and violence, and violence was foreign to his nature. But for a moment, he lingered over the picture of strangling Lord Peebles and burying him in the straw in Park Lane. There was something grotesquely attractive in the notion but probably the coroner's jury would give their verdict that he had been strangled by natural causes, and that death had been accelerated by the immediate prospect of a peerage. He himself had thrice been offered a peerage, once by the Liberals, once by the Conservatives, and once, prospectively, by the Labour Party. His invariable answer had been that previous engagements prevented him from accepting their kind invitation. That had amused him at the time, now it seemed deplorably witless. But could he not devise something for Lord Peebles that should spoil his pleasure? Why should Lord Peebles have that secret twinkle in his eye? Why should he, at his age, be still enjoying life? Waitley felt a murderous impulse towards his friend's mirth. But he could think of nothing, and with a sigh he took up a copy of that unique journal which is so justly famed for chronicling that which has not occurred and prophesying that which will not possibly happen and scarcely glancing at the leader, probably inspired by Ananias and the fashionable intelligence, certainly gleaned by Sapphira, he turned to the more reliable records of the police courts. There had been a brutal murder, apparently, the transgression of the Sixth Commandment was not wholly unattractive to people less tiresomely fastidious than himself, and a certain blameless archdeacon, whom he knew slightly, had, after the receipt of a series of threatening letters, to which answers were requested to be sent, accompanied by stout remittances, to A.M. Martin's Library, Wardour Street, reluctantly taken proceedings against the blackmailer, who had been rewarded 
with five years of enforced seclusion. Arthur Waitley wondered whether he himself would have the courage to prosecute a blackmailer. Probably not. With his wealth, it would be easier to satisfy the most rapacious. It was brave of the archdeacon. No doubt his artificially fostered sense of duty sustained him. His thoughts wandered on as he stared at the newspaper. Would he himself ever have the courage to blackmail anyone else? It must be the most exciting game, and to play it successfully would demand an extraordinary amount of intuition and knowledge of human nature. All depended on the character of your proposed victim. It would be as hopeless to try to extract money with threats out of some men, however scarlet the secrets of which you had possessed yourself, as, single-handed, to extract a lion's teeth. Others, no doubt, would equally certainly yield at once to the most veiled menace. Suddenly, the paper which he held began to rustle with the involuntary tremor of the hand that held it, and an eager excitement shot up like the light of a petroleum-soaked beacon in his dulled eye. He need no longer seek for agitation. He had found, when he least expected it, the answer to his fruitless appeals to the universe to supply him with interest. In the excitement of the moment, he poured a liberal dose of whiskey into a tumbler, but the next minute poured it back. He had to keep his head cool. Artificial stimulant only led to subsequent reaction and torpidity of thought. But through the prison bars, his spirit grasped hands with the archdeacon's victim. He would certainly blackmail somebody. There were two questions to settle. Whom should he blackmail? And what had his victim done? A moment's incisive thought told him that the second question, as to what the supposed crime had been, was alien and superfluous. The poor man need not have done anything. He need only be told that the events which occurred between, say, August the 2nd and August the 10th of the year before last were known to his persecutor. All else depended on the selection of a suitable victim. If an unsuitable subject was chosen, one whose life, could such be found, was of virtue so monstrously spartan that he would not mind the events of August the 2nd to the 10th, or those of any other date being known, it was clearly impossible to proceed. On the other hand, if his life was so voluminous a catalogue of crime that there were terrible affairs in every week of it, a notified period like this would create no particular impression. Yes, it was the character of the victim that must be studied if the aesthetic blackmailer was to have any fun. For, of course, in the case of Arthur Waitley, the mere extraction of two or three hundred pounds, thousands perhaps if his prey was wealthy, meant nothing at all. And the largest ingredient in the fun would be the uncertainty as to how the victim would behave, whether he would take proceedings or pay. He must therefore be cast in no iron mould. There would be little sport in writing just one letter and then being sent to join the poor worm, so grindingly crushed by the heel of the valiant archdeacon. Nor, on the other hand, would there be any zest in the punctual receipts of cheques whenever demanded. He had to think of somebody not too good and not too bad, not too brave and yet not pigeon-livered. For a while his mind hovered, singing like a skylark, in the exultation of this absorbing preoccupation. Then suddenly it dropped to earth again. There was none so fit as Lord Peebles. His hand trembled for the pen that was mightier than the sword, and after a few moments' concentrated thought, he dashed off these cold, cruel lines which would serve as the basis for attack. My lord, while congratulating your lordship on the well-deserved honour which the king has paid you, I feel it my duty to let your lordship know that the events which took place between August 2nd and August the 10th of the year before last 
are completely in the possession of the undersigned and are supported by documentary evidence of such sort that nobody who saw it could ever doubt its authenticity. I am prepared to give up to you all such papers as are in my possession for the sum of £2,000. I am a poor man and a desperate one, but I am strictly honourable in all business matters such as this, and on receipt of that sum, in gold, I will strictly carry out my obligations. Should your lordship take no notice of this communication, or refuse to comply with my request, the whole affair will be made public. I am well aware that I put myself within reach of the law in thus addressing you but I would ask your lordship carefully to consider the results to yourself if you prosecute me. The circumstances of which I am possessed will then all come out, and while it matters very little to me whether I pass the next few years in prison or not, I think that the consequences to you will not be so lightly regarded by self and family. You have a great deal to lose. I have nothing. Kindly communicate with me at Martin's Library, Wardour Street, by today week at latest. Having no club or settled address at present, I call there daily for letters and occasional parcels. Faithfully yours, George Loring. In obedience to the business-like qualities which had raised him to the position of multi-millionaire, his mind instantly went into committee over details. It was but very rarely that he employed his own hand in writing, for his correspondence was entirely dealt with by secretaries and typewriters, but it would be well to disguise his ordinary calligraphy. Or, stop, there was a safer way, and the next minute the Remington typewriter, which stood in the corner of the room, was opened and gleamed with bared keys. He was no adept at this clattering finger exercise, but after a few abortive trials he made a clumsy transcript of the letter and directed an envelope by the same mechanical device. Already the cautious instincts of the habitual criminal had awoke in him, and after replacing the cover on the typewriter, he carefully burned both his manuscript draft and the insane gibberish of his first typed attempts, and opening his window, let the blackened ashes float down into the straw-covered roadway. It would never do, again, to let the incriminating document lie among the other letters for post, and he hid it below the shirts in a wardrobe drawer in his bedroom in order to post it himself at some central letterbox next morning after verifying the existence of Martin's library. Then, since it was already very late, he went to bed with eager anticipation for the morrow, and many morrows. The next week was full of delightful interests. It passed in a spasm of absorbing moments, and he was astonished and disgusted at himself for not having entered sooner on a course of blackmail. True artist that he was, he did not pay constant visits to Martin's library, as soon as it was possible that there might be an answer to his letter, and ask if there was anything for George Loring but with a higher aestheticism, preferred to taste the delights of suspense, and determined not to make any inquiries till the notified week had elapsed. But he could not avoid haunting Wardour Street, picturing to himself, with artistic gusto, his official visit to the library. Once only was the flesh too strong, and... Though the week of grace had not yet expired, he could not resist the temptation of entering the library. The shop was empty, and, somewhat to his disappointment, showed no lines of filled and fitted shelves, as he had hoped. He had imagined the smell of leather bindings, bookcases full of venerable volumes of the fathers, a dignified and courtly librarian. Instead, he found a small deal counter on which were displayed the more odious of penny publications, and a stout old woman of comfortable appearance looked up from her knitting as he entered. But behind her, 
and his heart beat quicker at the sight, were rows of capacious pigeonholes, each initialed with a letter of the alphabet. But even as she asked him, in a hoarse, fruity voice, what she could do for him, he called on his finer instincts again, and instead of asking if there happened to be anything for George Loring, contented himself with buying society pars and frivol and fashion. With these prints in his hand, he left the shop without even looking at the letter L. But after all, perhaps, the commonplace sordidness of the establishment was of greater artistic value than his preconceived idea of it. It was a grimmer affair like this. It was more piquant, more trenchant, that white-faced men, trembling and unmanned by the possibility of dreadful disclosures coming to light, should bring their forfeits to this ordinary little establishment that their unseen and terrible persecutor should ask for letters from a comfortable old lady over a dingy deal counter. Hardly had he emerged when there drove by a motor in which, of all people, Lord Peebles was sitting, who waved an absent welcome to him. He saw at once how dangerous had been his visit. Supposing he had asked for letters for George Loring, and had staggered out of the shop with a scarcely manageable parcel of gold, to encounter such a meeting, it was distinctly within the bounds of possibility that that nobleman would connect him with George Loring. His blood ran cold at the thought, and yet it was a pleasing shiver, which at once suggested a further precaution, delightful in the devising. A disguise was imperatively necessary. He hailed a taxicab and spent an enraptured afternoon. George Loring had probably done this sort of thing before, and it might be supposed that, though poor and desperate, he retained from the fruits of his last crime clothes of a flashy and ill-fitting description such as he, would certainly wear a gaudy check shirt and cheap patent leather boots. His tie, of the Brussels carpet type, would assuredly be pinned with something too magnificent to be possibly valuable. Detachable cuffs and a dicky, a hat with a furrow in it, would complete his detestable array. Arthur Waitley himself was clean-shaven and solidly English in face. A moustache and imperial, therefore, suggesting a Polish conjurer, were indicated. These must be of convincing make, incapable of detection, and a visit to an expensive perichias with a brilliant tale of a fancy dress ball made the last visit of a thrilling afternoon. And that night, when the great house in Park Lane was silent and the electrical apparatus in the fan room adjusted, a figure, appalling to contemplate, strutted and pirouetted before the big looking-glass in his locked bedroom. All this, so exquisite to his pleasure-jaded palate, was but the material aspect of his adventure. Far sweeter and more recondite was the psychical honey of it. For, two days after George Loring had sent his letter, Lord Peebles telephoned to know whether Arthur Waitley would play golf with him, and though he detested and despised the game, he gave an enthusiastic affirmative and drove down with him to the mid-Surrey links at Richmond. Certainly, Lord Peebles looked worried and anxious, and the grey streak above his ears seemed, to the vigilant eye of his friend, to have assumed greater prominence. It's so good of you to ask me to play, said Waitley as they started. I'm a wretched performer, and I know your prowess. Oh, I expect we shall have a very even match, a very even match, said the other, and I needed a day off, though it's not Saturday. But there has been some worrying business lately, and I wanted to get into the country and forget all about it. Very worrying business. Waitley's eye gleamed secretly. 
these worries fed his soul. Indeed, I'm sorry to hear that, he said. Thank you, thank you. A purely private affair. Don't let us talk of it. Pretty the country looks. What's that river we are crossing? The River Thames, said Waitley, almost tremulously. Perhaps, said Lord Peebles. He cleared his throat. The Thames, he began, and then changed the subject to something amazingly foreign to that topic. It is strange how one's memory plays tricks with one, he said. A couple of days ago I was trying, quite idly, to recollect where I spent the early days of August, the summer before last, and was totally unable to recall what I had been doing. My wife remembers that we went to Scotland on the 11th, but she too has quite forgotten what we did just before. She inclines to think that I was paying some visits without her. Curious. Arthur Waitley laughed in a sprightly, rallying manner. Aha, he said. She's probably right, eh? Trust a wife's memory, my dear fellow, on that sort of point. No doubt she's right, returned the other. But it is strange that we can neither of us recollect where I went. Perhaps you never told her, said Waitley gaily. But come, dismiss those evasive topics. Let the past bury its dead. It is only the present that is truly ours. They had arrived at the clubhouse, and Waitley stepped out, followed by the heavier-footed peer. It was almost too good to be true that by sheer accident he had lighted on days that seemed hard to account for, and, treading on air, he hurried into the dressing-room, where, in momentary privacy, he was forced to indulge in a few toe-pointing capers of delight. And, after all, though the emotions with which he had supplied his friend were of anxious and ominous description, still, emotions after all, of whatever sort, are the salt of life, and here was a new one for him, something with a strong flavour about it. But he could afford to be generous, since he himself was being so richly entertained, and he did not grudge him one pang of the worry and anxiety inseparable from his position. Arthur Waitley's golf was generally of the most wayward description. He cut balls savagely to point and topped them, ventre terre, into cavernous bunkers, while Lord Peebles played a dreadfully steady game that, as a rule, walked arm in arm with bogey round the links. But today a strange upset of form took place, for while Lord Peebles seemed unable to hit any ball in the requisite direction or with the requisite force, Arthur Waitley, by virtue of the inscrutable laws that govern golf, performed with incredible excellence, and not unnaturally concluded that blackmailing is very good for the eye. Not for years had he felt so keenly the zest and ecstasy of living, and while watching his unfortunate opponent digging his ball out of tussocks of rank grass and eviscerating bunkers, he planned many similar adventures for the future. He felt as if he had awoke at last to his true nature. By accident he was a millionaire and the architect of his own colossal fortune. But by instinct and birth he seemed to be an aesthetic criminal. And the discovery had come upon him, though late, yet not too late. There might be many ecstatic years in store for him yet. The days of that enchanted week passed slowly, and each moment that brought him nearer Friday morning, when he would don his atrocious disguise and visit Martin's library, brought him no nearer any firm conjectures as to what he should find there. It so happened that he met his victim several times in the course of the week, and if, as on the occasion of their golf match, his mental and physical aspect seemed to indicate that he would assuredly lack the courage of the archdeacon and obediently pay his fine. On other occasions he showed a calmness and control that was consistent with more aggressive proceedings. To Waitley's knowledge, he transacted during that week a very difficult and intricate financial undertaking 
that caused certain bankers in Berlin to curse his acumen, and later he won the Mid-Surrey Monthly Medal, which looked as if his aberration had been only temporary. And the uncertainty and suspense thrilled and fascinated his persecutor. End of section two. Section three of The Countess of Lowndes Square and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim's Vox 4. The Countess of Lowndes Square and Other Stories by E. F. Benson. Blackmailing Stories, Chapter 2 The Blackmailer of Park Lane continued. It was about twelve o'clock on the Friday morning that a dejected four-wheeler stopped opposite Martin's library, and the ambulatory population of Wardour Street, accustomed to all manner of eccentricities, looked with wonder at the garish figure that emerged. Two hours before, Arthur Waitley had set off from Park Lane with a small portmanteau and had driven to the Charing Cross Hotel, having adjusted moustache and imperial with the aid of a small looking-glass in the cab, and had taken a room for a widower of the name of George Loring, paying for one night's habitation. There he had effected his change of clothes and left the valise containing the outer garments of Arthur Waitley, at present in a state of suspended existence. He entered the library with a strutting martial air, and, as once before, the comfortable old lady looked up from her knitting and asked how she could serve him. I have called for letters and parcels for Mr. George Loring, said Waitley in a falsetto voice, which was the result of diligent practice. But a glance at pigeonhole L showed him that it was empty. Yes, parcel and letter for Mr. George Loring, said the old dame but the parcel was too big to put in the pigeonhole, let alone lifting it, so I put them together somewhere. Deary me, now, where was it? This is a strange way to conduct a public library, said Waitley, forgetting all about the assumed falsetto, that the librarian should not know where she has deposited the property of her subscribers. Mr. Martin would be far from pleased. I am pressed for time, madam. Business in the city. The old lady turned slowly round and beamed on him. And as if I wasn't sitting on it all the time, she said, just for safety, as you may say. There, young man, you'll find it heavy, and the sixpence to pay. A most reasonable charge, madam, said Waitley. And, uh, and can you tell me who left the parcel, what he looked like? She nodded at him. Such a fur coat I never see, she said, and his motor fair stopped at traffic. I didn't take much account of his face, though I would swear to a beard. A shrewd observer, said Waitley, in his most genial tones, and, staggering out of the shop with his parcel, deposited it on his own toe as he stepped into the cab. The pain was severe, and for the moment damped his ecstasy and caused him a loss of self-control. Charing Cross Hotel, you old idiot, was his unjustifiable direction to his cabman. As he drove there, he tore open the note. It ran as follows. Dear sir, you have me completely in your power, and I send the money you demand. Kindly forward at once the documentary evidence you speak of. Faithfully yours, Peebles. Again, he felt vaguely disappointed. The fish had given him less play than he hoped. He had but towed its sulking carcass to land. But, then, he did not know that there followed him, threading the intricacies of traffic close behind him, a taxicab in which was sitting a quiet-looking gentleman with pince-nez. Its destination also appeared to be Charing Cross Hotel. The hall porter opened the door of his cab, and Waitley indicated his parcel. 
Move that into the bureau, if you'll be so kind, he said. It contains a, a model, a metal model, and is heavy. I'm going upstairs to change my clothes and will be down again in ten minutes. Less time than that was sufficient for him to resume the habiliments of Arthur Wheatley and stow the apparel of the vanished George Loring in his bag. His imperial and moustache he still wore, for it was his intention to use depilatory measures in the cab which took him back to Park Lane, lest the complete transformation might prove too staggering for the hall porter. This time he himself took the parcel, a wooden box, clearly wrapped up in brown paper, to his cab, put it not on his own foot, but on the seat opposite, and genially told the driver to take him to Park Lane. Close behind him followed the taxicab containing the gentleman with the pince-nez, modest, secluded, and unobserved. And from a few doors off, he saw Mr. Arthur Waitley, burdened with the parcel he had brought from Wardour Street, stagger into his own house. His business seemed to be not yet finished, for, having seen him home, he drove back to an office in the city and was at once taken in to see the head of the firm. His interview lasted about half an hour, and he left behind him, when he went, a very much astonished gentleman, over whose mobile face a succession of queer secret smiles chased one another like gleams of sunshine on a cloudy day. Excellent businessman though he was, he gave for the rest of the day but a tepid attention to his work. Arthur Waitley, meantime, was closeted with his gold. With the aid of a pair of nail scissors, for prudence counselled secrecy, he succeeded in raising the lid of the box and found it packed inside with smooth, discreet little sausages of white paper. A couple of these he unfolded, and from each flowed out a stream of clinking sovereigns. In each were a round hundred, and the little sausages were twenty in number. He put a liberal handful of gold in his pocket. He locked the rest into the safe that stood in the bedroom. And those two thousand pounds were somehow sweeter to him than his whole unnumbered fortune. They seemed to him the reward of a cleverness that was more peculiarly his own than that which had amassed so huge a harvest in South African mines and American options. They were doubly sweet, for they were both the fruit of secret criminal processes and had been wrung by terror out of his friend. He lunched out that day. His soul basked in the heaven of high animal spirits which had so long been lost to him, and in the stimulus which the last week had brought to him, he felt like a Perry who had regained paradise. Perhaps reaction would come, but for the present it held aloof, and in case it did, he could always, as he phrased it to himself as he walked lightly down Bond Street, apply the squeezers again to poor Peebles. The vocabulary, as well as the spirits of a schoolboy, had come back to him. Long-forgotten slang tripped off his tongue, and he examined shop windows with eager enthusiasm. There was a beautiful Charles II rat-tail spoon in a shop of old silver, and he entered and bought it, paying for it on the spot with fifteen of his newly acquired sovereigns. The purchase gave him more pleasure than any he had made for years. It was the fruit of his splendid stroke of blackmail. At another shop, he bought for five pounds a charming figure of a seagull in Copenhagen, China. Lord Peebles had a collection of this pale fabric, and his friend felt it would be a privilege to add to it. That also was paid for in gold, and after he had left each shop, a quiet man entered and conferred privately with the proprietor, leaving a companion outside who strolled after the millionaire. Returning home, he sent out a number of invitations for a dinner party in ten days' time. A royal princess had intimated that she would like to dine with him that night, 
and he included in his invitations Lord and Lady Peebles, both of whom were snobs of purest ray serene. Later on, he would ask them again to some similar function, for he felt that two such invitations would make full compensation for the anxiety he had caused. He did not regard the bagatelle of gold. That meant nothing to either of them. Then, after an hour with his beautiful collection of Greek coins, he dressed and went out to dinner. Lord Peebles was of the party, and the two cut into a table of bridge afterwards and played for a couple of hours, with luck distinctly against the newly created peer. Generally, his losses caused him exquisite agony. Being very rich, he could not bear to be ever so little poorer. But tonight he laid down a couple of ten-pound notes with a smile. "'I pay you, my dear Waitley,' he said. Fourteen pounds, is it not? I wonder if you can give me six. Waitley could, and did. You have had the worst of luck, he observed genially, but it's only a game. By the way, I hope I shall see you and your wife to dinner on the 23rd. I sent you an invitation this evening. Lord Peebles took up his change and looked rather carefully at each sovereign in turn, as if to question its genuineness. Curious thing, he said, each of these sovereigns is marked. There is a small capital P scratched on the field in front of St. George. He passed one over to Waitley, who felt as if some warning whistle had sounded remotely in his ears, but he contrived to speak in his natural voice and got up. I see, he said. I wonder what that means. Bates gave me them just before I came out. Indeed, said Lord Peebles negligently. Yes, the 23rd would be delightful. Are you going? Yes, I think I shall be off, said Waitley. He drove back to Park Lane, and without setting the pleasant peal of electric bells in the fan room, went straight to his bedchamber and got out the box which had thrilled him with such exquisite pangs of pleasure that morning. He stripped the paper off sausage after sausage of gold until his bed was piled with the precious metal. And on each shining disc, the same ominous discovery met his eye. Just in front of St. George's head on every one that he took up was scratched a small capital P. He slept far from well that night, for his mind, spinning madly like a whirling top, came into collision with a series of hard angles of uncomfortable circumstances. He told himself that it was inconceivable that his friend should have suspected him of the odious crime of blackmailing. But his friend evidently, when paying the ransom, had taken steps to trace its destination, with a view to the apprehension of the criminal. By a most strange coincidence, it was he, Arthur Waitley, who had supplied him with a clue, though he had had the presence of mind to say that Bates had given him these six pieces of evidence. Then, with a pang of alarm that made him sit bolt upright in bed, he remembered that there were four more of them in the shop where they sold china cats and seagulls, fifteen more in the silversmiths where he had bought the Charles II spoon, and two others in the hair-cutting establishment in St. James's Street, where he had so lightly purchased a safety razor and a small India rubber sponge. At all costs, he must repossess himself of these. And how was that to be done? In this short summer night, there was scarcely time, even if he had had the tools to make a series of single-handed burglaries. Yet, if he did not get those accursed sovereigns back, he was letting the tap of evidence drip and drip and drip. What, again, was the use of those nineteen hundred and odd sovereigns on his bed if he could not put them in circulation without multiplying the evidence already in existence? The suspense of the last week, it is true, had been thrilling and delicious, but it appeared now that there were at least two sorts of suspense, and the other, though quite as thrilling, was not so pleasant. 
sinking into an uneasy slumber, he dreamed of Skilly. Haggard and unshaven, in spite of the new safety razor, he was in Bond Street next morning early, with checkbook and banknotes in his pocket. The shop that dealt in old silver was only just open, and he went hurriedly in. I am Mr. Waitley, he said. Mr. Waitley of Park Lane. Uh, dear me, that's a very pretty tankard. A hundred pounds only. Please send it round to me to number 93. The fact is, a rather curious thing has happened. I bought a Charles II spoon here yesterday afternoon and paid for it in sovereigns. For certain curious, I may say family, reasons, I very much want those sovereigns back again. There are sentimental associations with them, you understand. Could you kindly let me have them back and take my cheque or bank notes in exchange? The shopman laughed. Well, sir, very curious thing happened here, too, he said brightly. You'd hardly left the shop when a gentleman came in and asked if I could let him have any change for some banknotes. There were your sovereigns lying in the till, and I gave him them all. I offered him five more as well, but after examining those, he said he did not want more than fifteen. Arthur Waitley couldn't suppress a slight groan. That was very precipitate of you, he said. What was the gentleman like? Was it a stout, dark-faced gentleman with yellowish hair and and probably a fur coat? No, sir. A clean-shaven gentleman, with a sharp sort of face. Not Peebles, said Waitley to himself, as he skimmed out of the shop. It may still only be a coincidence. The shop of Danish China was open, and again he told his lame and unconvincing tale. Here again, the fever for gold had run riot yesterday afternoon, and a gentleman with a big moustache had taken five sovereigns and left a banknote. And his scuttling footsteps took him to the aseptic hairdressers. I am fighting single-handed against a positive gang of these wretches, was his bitter comment. But the aseptic hairdressers were still shut, and after ringing several wrong bells belonging to different floors, he gave up in despair and went home to the mocking splendour of number 93. A fresh-faced stable boy was just laying down the straw in the street, whistling as he plied his nimble pitchfork. Waitley wondered whether he would ever whistle again. For an hour he sat there, lost in a scorching desert of barren thought. Visions of oakum and broad arrows flitted through his disordered mind, and every now and then he came to himself as some fresh circumstance of dawning significance rapped on his brain. Once he hurried upstairs, remembering that the awful attire of George Loring still lurked in a locked cupboard of his bedroom, and he took the criminal's coat and stuffed it in the fire of his sitting-room, with the intention of burning all that costume which had seemed so exquisitely humorous. But the coat seemed impervious to flames, and it was not till a quarter of an hour later that he came downstairs again with roasted face. Even then there were trousers and shirt and patent leather boots to get rid of, and trouser buttons and the base metal of his gorgeous tie-pin would be found amid the ashes. And even when it was all done, he would only have destroyed one thread of evidence, leaving a network of imperishable circumstance unimpaired. Truly, there was a dark side to the game on which he had so lightly embarked, which the callous world could not ever so faintly appreciate, or would probably but imperfectly sympathise with even if it did. But for the sake of saving his sanity, he had to occupy himself with something, and after vainly attempting to follow the meaning of a leader in the times, he began reading, purely as a sad narcotic exercise, the agony column. And then he fairly bounded from his seat as the following met his eye. To George Loring, a packet of marked sovereigns, twenty-eight in number, will be forwarded to the above named at any address, or given to a messenger who hands to Mr. Arthur Armstrong, resident for this day only at the Charing Cross Hotel, the sum of four thousand in numbers and in words. 
in banknotes or bullion. He groaned aloud. It spells beggary, he said to himself, but I must have those sovereigns. But let me see first whether twenty-eight is the full tale of them. And he snatched up a piece of paper and wrote, To Lord Peebles, six. Silver Shop, fifteen. Copenhagen, China, five. Hair cutting place, two. Total, twenty-eight. And at that, in spite of the ruinous expense, his heart bounded high within him. It was wiser not to appear himself. He had, so it struck him, appeared rather too frequently already. And sending for his secretary, he scrawled a cheque for £4,000 and bade him have it changed into banknotes and take it at once to the Charing Cross Hotel. There he would ask for a certain Mr Arthur Armstrong, who would give him a packet containing 28 marked sovereigns. It concerns a widowed aunt of mine, he added, and I cannot tell you more. Speed and secrecy are essential to save her from ruin. The zealous secretary was back within an hour, and with a sob of relief, Waitley, when he was alone, opened the packet he bought. Next moment, with a hollow groan, he spilled the contents all over the table. The sovereigns were marked indeed, but each of them had neatly incised on it, not a P, but an interrogation mark. Back went the zealous secretary again to explain that these were not the right ones, and if necessary, to implore Mr. Arthur Armstrong, for the sake of his mother, to give up the others. He was soon home again with the news that Mr. Arthur Armstrong had already quitted the hotel, leaving no address. Later on that abject day, there arrived a note from Lord Peebles saying that it was doubtful whether he could come to dinner on the 23rd. Events, at present private, might render it impossible. But he would like a game of golf at Richmond next day if Waitley was at liberty. Again, this proposal of a recreation detestable in itself and intolerable to one with shaking hand and trembling knees. Yet if Peebles had proposed a game of leapfrog, Waitley could not be so imprudent as to refuse, for at all costs he must keep up friendly relations. He had half a mind, but not the other half, to tell his friend that it was indeed he who had attempted to blackmail him, for a joke, and that the retaliation was getting beyond one. But it was not certain as yet that a confession was necessary. There was nothing to show that Lord Peebles had identified him with George Loring. It looked like it. It looked uncommonly like it. But what proof had he? Waitley, it is true, had given him half a dozen of his own marked sovereigns, and no doubt Peebles knew that he had expended others on Copenhagen China, Charles II Silver, and American articles of toilet. But that was all. It was certainly a good deal. There's no need to dwell on his further anguish. The game of golf was a cruel parody of sport, and Peebles was in his most pompous mood, speaking of the House of Lords as we. At other times he spoke with strange persistence of the horrors of English prisons, and mentioned that he had been appointed visitor to Wormwood Scrubs. Waitley did not know with any accuracy where that was, but Peebles described exactly how you could get to it. Long sentence men stayed there. Another day he would see, or think he saw, a stranger watching his house. Sometimes a second would join him, and if one was clean-shaven and the other had a moustache, Waitley's heart would leap to his throat and creakingly pulsate there. His appetite failed him, his brushes were full of shed hair, dew suddenly broke out on his forehead, and seven dreadful days past. Then the end came. Lord Peebles telephoned to him, asking if he could see him on important business, and of course a welcoming affirmative was given. You appear far from well, my dear Waitley, he said, looking anxiously at him. Far from well. A little dieting, do you think? A little regular work? A little abstention from alcohol? Waitley gave a haggard glance out of the window. 
It was a foggy morning, and in the roadway he could but faintly distinguish a large black van which had approached noiselessly over the straw and now stood there. At that sight there was no longer any doubt in his mind that Peebles had adopted the ruthless, archdiaconal attitude towards blackmailers and was going to have him arrested. But, harassed and unnerved as he was by a succession of sleepless nights and nightmare days, he still despised and refused to parley with the conventional narrowness of his accuser. Yet Lord Peebles still wore his pleased and secret smile, and it was not good manners to look like that in the act of committing a friend to a convict prison. Waitley drew himself up and spoke with wonderful steadiness and dignity. I see it's all up, he said, and that I shall soon get all the things you so feelingly recommend. But after all, I had a perfectly amazing week when I waited for your answer. I don't deny that you have given me an awful week too, or that there are many rather cheerless weeks in front of me. It's no use my attempting to explain. You would never understand. Your soul doesn't rise above sovereigns. Lord Peebles came a step nearer him, looking vexed. For those remarks, he said, you deserve to be treated as... as you deserve. You don't seem to realise that I have had a week of the most thrilling enjoyment. You think nobody has a sense of humour except yourself. That attitude of yours has often annoyed me, for I have a remarkably keen one, and for pure aesthetic pleasure I have just had the week of my life. The fact that it was sugared with revenge hardly enhanced it at all, nor did the fact that whereas you got two thousand pounds out of me... I got four thousand out of you. You have been like a monkey dancing on a hot plate. I have been the hot plate. Waitley was scarcely listening. With chattering teeth, he looked at the huge, ominous van in the street, and Lord Peebles followed his gaze. You deserve that that van should be Black Maria, he went on in injured tones, to take you to Wormwood Scrubs, where I am visitor. Is, isn't it? asked Waitley. Lord Peebles peered into the fog. The harmless, necessary pantechnicon, he said. And then he subsided into a chair, and his great bulk began to shake with spasms of ungovernable laughter. And gradually the colour came back to Waitley's face, and shortly after an uncertain smile hovered on his mouth. And... Is it all over? he asked. Lord Peebles took a small sausage of sovereigns out of his pocket. I brought these along with me, he said. Please count them. They are all marked, and there are twenty-eight of them. I will exchange them with those you possess, marked with an interrogation point. You shall, said Waitley. God bless you. I was not certain when I came here, continued Lord Peebles disregarding this interruption, whether I should put you out of your suspense or not, but your haggard and emaciated appearance, my dear fellow, decided me. Besides, I am two thousand pounds to the good, or nearly so, for I owe some small sum to detectives. If I did not have mercy on you, you would probably be too unwell to give your party for the princess on the 23rd, and I should be sorry to miss that. Otherwise, I might have let you had a week or so more of excitement. I had several other little notions, little tunes for you to dance to. You shall sit next to her, said Waitley, with quivering lips. End of section three.